you 12-1 for leading us in worship and singing of those words that have beautiful content and meaning and truth. They have meaning because they are truth. Um, so thank you for leading us in worship. I want to say thank you to Dr. Dockery for inviting me to preach in chapel one last time. As he said, I'm going to be returning to the church, which is my uh, true love, and uh, I have very much enjoyed my time here getting to know uh, colleagues, getting to know students, and uh, just greatly appreciate uh, this chapter in my life. And, uh, and we should remember this, that, that every single moment of your life is a part of your testimony. And your testimony is an ongoing testimony of God's grace and mercy, even if we cannot see it today. That is a story which Christ will finish, and he will be glorified in every moment of our lives. With that in mind, I want to ask you uh, if you're familiar with an Old Testament concept. That Old Testament concept is the concept of standing stones. Uh, this, this concept has a number of other terms, stones of remembrance, stones of testimony. You see, early on in the Pentateuch, there was a practice and a habit that every time God did something amazing, every time that God did something that demonstrated his greatness, his strength, his love towards his covenant people in faith, that they would take stones of remembrance and they would stand them and stack them together so that those standing stones, stones of remembrance, would not be seen as a natural rock formation, but rather that someone took the time intentionally to stand and gather these rocks so that as they passed by, they would say, what happened here? And those rocks piled together would be a standing stone testimony, not of me, not of you, not of Israel, but rather of God and his grace and his strength and his power and his steadfast love and faithfulness to his people. Those standing stones were testimonies of God and his power, his grace, his mercy, and his faithfulness. In other words, just as Peter says in the New Testament, he calls us, those who are united to Christ by faith, he says, you are living stones. Now that has a wide range of meaning. It's talking about being united into Christ. We are the house of Christ. We are the royal priesthood of Christ. But it also says this. It says, your life is to be a continual testimony that speaks to the glory of God in Christ. Friends, when was the last time that you gave your testimony? Sometimes we can overuse that term testimony in Christian legalese, right? We use that term over and over and over again, and sometimes it loses its meaning. But I think a testimony, one, has one primary purpose in four parts. The primary purpose of any good testimony is always to give glory and honor to God in Christ. If you try to give a testimony that is really you bragging and boasting about your former days, one, we're going to question your heart as to whether you're converted or not, but two, that's a story of you and it ends up being about your idolatry more than it is the glory of God and grace in Christ. A great testimony focuses on one focuses on God, focuses on his glory, his grace, his power, and his work amongst you in the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the main goal of a testimony. A great testimony has probably at least four parts. Now, our, our evangelism professors, our missions professors, they're the experts in this, and they might say there's more, but I think a great testimony has at least four parts. Part one says, what was I before I was in Christ? In other words, what was I when I was under the delusion of sin? You see, the word of God is very clear that uh, all people everywhere have been recipients of what Dr. Dockery this morning called general revelation. General revelation is, is creation and conscience. It is those things that every single person who has ever been and whoever will be has been the recipient of general, meaning general truths about God, but non-salvific truths about God. General truths about God, and everyone knows without exception that there is a God. He is a God of order. He is a God of power. He is a God of might, he is a God to be obeyed, and he is a God who will hold all people accountable as our creator and sustainer. The problem is, is that Romans 1 tells us what we do who are fallen in sin. We, have, we are the recipients of first Adam's failure. 
When he fell, the word of God said because he was our federal head and our corporate representative, when he fell, we fell. So what do we who are fallen by nature do with that general revelation? The word of God says we, gen we exchange the truth of God for a lie, not hesitantly, but gladly. We take that truth which we know innately to be true, that truth that God is at the center, his plan, his will, his timing, his Christ, and we take that truth and we gladly exchange the truth of God for a lie so that we are at the center, I'm at the center, and God revolves around me, my plan, my will, my freedom. That's that exchange. The word of God says we are rebels by our very nature. So what were you when you were a rebel to the will of God. Part one of a good testimony says, here's what I was. Not in a bragatory sense, but to say, here are the things in which drove me emotionally. Here are the things that drove my heart, that drove everything that I wanted to be. As for me, baseball was my God. Actually, that's a lie. I was my own God, and the baseball was the vehicle by way I wanted my name to be in lights. That was how I gladly exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Step two in a great testimony is that moment of amazing grace when Jesus Christ pursues us and tracks us down and changes us in the moment of an eye in salvation. That is step two. Always be willing to say, here's what I was before Christ and here's what I was when Christ tracked me down and pursued me and saved me. And when he saves us, it changes my everything. I'm no longer the person I used to be. I'm no longer the one that's driven by these former passions and lusts of idolatry to see my own name in lights. But rather, I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. And him saving me changes my everything. Step three in a great testimony is to say where I am now. One, what I used to be before Christ. Two, when Christ saved me. Three, where I am now. Let me tell you how my life has changed. Not because I'm so good, but because my Christ is so faithful. Let me show you how through the Spirit's illumination in my life that he has changed my heart, my thinking, my mind, and everything that drives me. He is now my pursuit. And step four of a great testimony is where we're going. What I used to be when Christ found me where I am today and where we're going. A great testimony says someday I know that this life that I'm running, this race that I'm running right now, it is not in vain because I know that my Christ is faithful not only to save me, but I know that he is faithful. He has already ascended. He is already seated in his session at the right hand of God the Father, God the Son, and Christ, or God the Holy Spirit. As the second Adam, he is seated there in his session, and he's ruling with all things underneath his feet, not only in his, in his divine nature, but as second Adam, all of creation is being rightly ruled in his dominion as second Adam. And I know that he will rule and reign until all of salvation history is accomplished until he returns again. And when he returns again, guess what? Every single one of us who are united to Christ by faith, we will be resurrected. And he will take me to glory where I will love and live to sin no more. A great testimony has four stages. What I was, when Christ saved me, where I am today, and where we're going. I think that is what Paul is doing in this portion of Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. I think if you look at that passage with that lens, you can see what he was when Christ pursued him and saved him, where he is now in union with Christ. And in verse 11, you're going to see where he knows that Christ will take him. Let's unpack this passage seen in that perspective and help it shape our testimony to give God glory in Christ first. We look at verse 7a. 7a says these words, which will drive us back to Dr. Wilkinson's sermon last Thursday. It says this, but whatever these things were, which were gained to me, those things, we have to stop right there and say, what are the things that Paul used to count as gain? He's driving us back to stage one of his testimony. What I used to be when I was outside of Christ. Let's say it with biblical terms. What Paul used to be when he was a wicked unbeliever outside of Christ. Make no mistake, friends, there is no three camps. You're either in Christ or you're wicked. That's what scripture says. 
You are either saved in Christ or not saved in Christ. There is no third category called almost there. His conversion on the road to Damascus, which we'll get to this morning, that was the moment of his regeneration and that was the moment of his saving faith. Prior to that, he was under sin's delusion, under sin's power, pursuing something that was contrary to Christ. Thus, he was a wicked pagan unbeliever. He mentions five things. We'll fly through them because Dr. Wilkinson has already discussed them. We go back to verse five, the first one. The first two are things that he thinks he was born into. That's sin's delusion, number one. And then three things, three things that he thinks he could obtain through his own efforts in the flesh. Verse five, first, circumcised on the eighth day. Paul assumed, Paul, when he was outside of Christ, he assumed that he was an owner of the Abrahamic covenant. Remember, Genesis 17 says that the sign of circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And here's the thing about Old Testament covenants is that you can be under a covenant, but not an owner of the covenant. You can have the sign of the covenant upon you and not be an owner of the covenant. You're only an owner of the covenant if you have faith in the Messiah who would be Christ. That's the only way that you can be an owner of that covenant is to believe in the promise of gospel that culminates in Christ. This has always been from the very beginning. At the moment our first Adam fell, guess what God does he gives us gospel. He gives us Genesis 3.15 that says because the first Adam, the first man fell, there's going to come that is going to be a second man, a second Adam, a seed from the woman who would be the son of man who will succeed everywhere where the first Adam fell. That's gospel that has to be believed that would culminate in Christ. Do you know how Adam and Eve were saved? Because they believed in that gospel in Christ to come. Do you know how Noah is found righteous in Genesis chapter 5 and 6? It's because he believed in that gospel and it was counted righteous to us. Do you know how Abraham was counted righteous? Because he believed God and the promise of the gospel, which Galatians 3 said the seed of Abraham is Jesus Christ. Jesus looks back at that and says, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. You can have the sign of a covenant, thus placing you underneath it but you can only be an owner of the covenant by faith in the gospel which will come out to be Christ. And since Paul did not believe in Christ prior to the Damascus road, he was not an owner of the Abrahamic covenant. He thought his birthright brought him as an owner in the Abrahamic covenant and the word of God says he could not be more wrong. Second, he said, by birthright, he says, a nation of Israel tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews. He assumed that by his birthright, he too was a true owner and authentic owner of the Mosaic Covenant. And the word of God is very clear about this. It doesn't matter who you were brought into. It doesn't matter your lineage or your ethnicity. The word of God is very clear specifically about that first generation, which we would call the Exodus generation. The book of Hebrews says, God speaking, Hebrews 3 and 4, that first generation, with a few exceptions, right? Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and a few others. He said, they will never enter my rest. Rest is a symbol for Sabbath and ultimately heaven itself. And he says, and here's why. Because of their wicked, do you remember the next word? Unbelieving hearts. Your birth, your physical birthright, it might bring you into privilege. It might be a position in which gives you special revelation, but you can only be an owner of a covenant through faith in the gospel that ultimately culminates in Christ. It must be with faith. Always has been, always will be. Delusion number two comes in three forms, things that he thinks or thought when he was under sin's delusion that he could carry out in the deeds of the body. He says, verse, the end of verse five, as to the law, a Pharisee. Do you know what scripture calls any teaching of the law that does not culminate in Jesus Christ? False teaching. If we try to teach the law, here's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, if we try to teach the Old Testament without seeing its conclusion and ultimate teleos, end goal, in Christ, we have misunderstood the purpose of it and we have misled our hearers. Paul tried to teach a Christless law and he says that was when I was under the delusion of sin. Next, he says, 
as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. A persecutor of the church. Isn't it amazing that in a moment when we get to Acts chapter 9 and we discuss Paul's salvation, that moment when grace found him in the person of Christ, that Christ blinds him. And as he is blinded, they're not being able to see. Do you remember the words of Christ? He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute, not others, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Never forget this. When you go out of your way to hurt and harm the people of Christ, you are, in fact, trying to harm Christ himself. Because those who are in saving union with Jesus Christ are so united to Christ spiritually that to try to separate us is folly. If you are in Christ, you are in Christ. And thus, when those who try to harm the people of Jesus Christ, who live to cause suffering and tribulation to the people of God, you're actually under sin's delusion of thinking that you're trying to... Paul here thought he was doing God a favor. He was under such delusion of sin that he thought that he was killing Christians. He was doing the will and work of God. Friends, never be deluded in this. You will have people in your ministry who are the most amazing people you will ever meet. And then you're going to have a group. There's always going to be a couple in your ministry setting who think it's their job to bring pain and suffering and to be hurdles to the people of Jesus Christ. Never forget this verse. You cannot separate. You cannot separate Christ from his people. And the word of God summarizes the law in this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And how do you demonstrate it? By loving your neighbor as yourself. There's going to be some in your ministry who are Christians who are struggling. There's going to be others in your ministry setting who are not believers at all, but who are under the, the, the delusion that say they are. And you'll know them by their fruit. They will know us by our love, or you will know them by the lack thereof. Fruit will always display what is here in the heart. And those who harm the people of Christ I'll let the word of God speak for itself. Paul was under that delusion. He was taking joy in and delight in harming the people of Jesus Christ, thinking that he was doing God a favor. All the while, the people of Christ feared his very name. That's the power of sin's delusion. Lastly, he says, as to righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Friends, Paul is admitting here that he was just as blind as the rich young ruler when he came before Christ and said, how might I enter the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, it's simple, uphold the law. But that's funny. <laughs> because we're dead in our sins and trespasses and we can't keep any portion of the law at any moment in our own efforts. Keep the law, he says. And here's what the delusion of sin says. Which part? Oh, love your neighbors yourself. Love God. These I've done. That is the delusion of sin. You know why the law was given? Because we're sinners. The law is a direct reflection of the infinitely perfect nature of God and it is given to us as sinners so that when we look at the law and see that God demands infinite perfection that we realize I can't keep any portion of this for one millisecond of any day. I need, and here's where the law points us, not only to our own sin but points us to Christ as the only one, our substitute, who could drives us to our sin and our need for our substitute. Only those who are under sin's delusion look at the law and say, I've got it, what else? Surely there must be more. Those are those things that used to drive Paul when he was a wicked pagan unbeliever. Let me ask you, in the first portion of your testimony, what used to drive you? I wanted to see my name in lights. I wanted to hear people say my name, elevate my name and my works, my hunches. If you're being honest with yourself, that story of Paul, that story of me, is probably the first point in your testimony. What were you? Where were you before you were in Christ? Where were you when you were being driven by passions that led you to look at your name and want it to be in lights? Where were you 
when you had gladly exchanged the truth of God for a lie so that you thought you were the center and that you had self-sovereignty and that God revolved around you rather than us revolving around God. Step one. Step two, everything changes. Look at the second part of verse seven. He says this. He says, whatever these things which were gained to me, these things I have now counted as Loss. He says it again in verse 8, more than that. I count all these things, all the things that I used to think were beneficial, all the things that used to drive me and motivate me, I now count them as loss. And then he says it in a stronger term at the end of verse 8. He says, and count them as rubbish. That word there is not only rubbish, uh, but he says it's animal dung. It is refuse. These things which used to drive me, they're loss, they're penalty, they're things that place me in the hole, in the negative. More than that, they're animal waste. And here's the thing, how does that type of thinking change? How does that type of thing, those things which drove us, how is it that we now have a different mindset? And he tells us in verses seven and eight, he says this, these things which were gained to me, these things I now count as loss, For the sake of Christ, he says it stronger in verse 8, more than that, I count all these things to be lost in view of the surpassing value, the most excellent. There is no greater thing, no more excellent thing than this, than in knowing Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus as my Lord. Do you know how it is that anyone can do that? It is not in here. It is not in here and it is not in here. This is something that is a supernatural miracle that's not done here. It's done to us by the power of God. In Acts chapter 9, we are reminded of when God's grace pursued and found Paul. He was on his way to harm Christians. He was on his way, almost doing the the, the Dr. Evil laugh. He was like... (laughs) That was funny. (laughs) He's on his way to harm the people of God, those for whom Christ died. And as he's on his way to carry out his mission of death under the delusion of sin, that's where Christ in his amazing grace moment tracked him down and knocked him down and blinded his eyes. That's when Paul's world changed. That was the moment of his, his regeneration. We know this because Acts chapter 9 immediately says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being sent from Christ in his session, sent from Christ, comes down, pursues Paul changes his heart, changes his nature in regeneration, removes that former heart of stone, of wickedness under sin's delusion, and exchanges it with a heart of flesh, a heart that loves Christ. Everything changed at that moment. His heart, his motivation, his desires, his everything has changed. His goals, his passion his reason for living, his reason for being. He no longer wants his name in light. He wants Christ's name in light. And notice this, it says, knowing, knowing Christ Jesus as Lord. He's not merely talking about an intellectual knowledge. He's talking about a relationship that changes everything. And the Holy Spirit not only regenerates and changes his heart, changes his mind. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 9 shows us that his, the Holy Spirit began to illuminate Christ. Because it says immediately he began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God. His everything has changed. Friends, when was the moment of your change? When was the moment that Christ tracked you down and saved you? That the Spirit of God regenerated you, removed your heart of stone, and gave you a heart of flesh, and then gave you a desire to love God, a desire to pursue God, a desire no longer to see your name in lights, but to demean yourself and elevate and raise up the name and cause of Christ. When was that moment? Because that is step two in your testimony, in your conversion as a standing stone. And three, Paul begins that third moment of a testimony and it's called in union with Christ. We see this in verse nine. Paul says not only, not only is it in knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord, that moment of regeneration, that moment of salvation, that I may gain Christ, verse nine, so that I might be found in him. 
It is shorthand theological language for the doctrine of union with Christ. And you remember that union with Christ is this. It is at the moment of saving faith when the Spirit of God regenerates us, gives us spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear, and the scales fall off. And he gives us a gift of faith, right? Ephesians 2 says, faith is not of your own. It is a gift given to you by God. And he gives us that piercing moment in our hearts where we confess initial saving of faith and repentance. And that moment of conversion, we are now united to Jesus Christ spiritually, inseparably. You can, from that moment forward, never be separated from Christ. Never. And in union with Christ means this, all of the work of Christ as the God-man, as the second Adam, has been applied to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, which means everything that he did, everything that he accomplished is now applied to you at conversion. And in your sanctification, you grow and grow and grow and grow and grow more and more and more in the image of God in Jesus Christ. So you as a believer, you are in union with Christ. Everything has changed, you're in union with Christ. And here's the beautiful thing, that first move that Paul makes after he realizes that he is in union with Christ and never to be separated, that all of Christ's work is now applied to the people of God. Verse nine, he says this, and so that I might be found in him, in spiritual union with Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. Do you see that move that was previous uh, in, in contrast to the end of verse six? Previously, under sin's delusion, I thought I could obey the law. Now he knows I can't. And I must have Jesus Christ. And he says, now that I'm in union with Christ, his righteousness, not mine. My righteousness is his filthy rags. His righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, has now been imputed to me. This is a beautiful thing. Do you know what righteousness is? It's earned, first off. It is obedience. You earn righteousness through perfect obedience, which is why I can't do it and neither can you. And the law is proof of that. But there is one who did, and only one, and that is Christ Jesus as the second Adam. He came. He came. In the incarnation, and this is what Philippians chapter 2 is picking up. This is what Dr. Grace uh, alluded us to several weeks ago. This is, he's walking through Christ in two things. In Christology, when we study the doctrine of Christ, we study him as second Adam, prophet, priest, and king. Those are all categories under Adam. But then we also talk about two things. The steps to humiliation, the steps going down. The steps to humiliation lead to the road to the exaltation of Christ. And three things he mentions here in verse 9 and 10 talk to us about us being in spiritual union with Christ and following the same path, the path of humiliation. The way up is first the way down. The way to glory, the way to exaltation with Christ is to follow him in the steps of humiliation. And he brings up three points. First is this. He says, righteousness in Christ. Christ in his incarnation is born in his human nature into this fallen world, has no change to his divine nature, right? We understand this through mutability and other things, but Christ in his human nature is born sinless of a virgin, but he is born into a broken, fallen world. Why? Because first Adam put us there. And here he is born into a broken, sinful, fallen world. But in this world, he is carrying out his work of reconciliation, but he does it in a world of suffering, in a world of brokenness. Every miracle that he carries out is carried out in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials, in the midst of persecution, in a world that does not want him to succeed. His being the second Adam is carried out in the brokenness of first Adam, including his righteousness, Christ was perfect to the plan of God, to the will of God, to the timing of God as demonstrated through the law. The law can show you our sin, but the law cannot give you righteousness. Christ's righteousness comes from God alone. And it's proof that he is perfectly, infinitely perfect in God's plan, in his will, in his timing as demonstrated through the law. So that when on Calvary's cross, Christ is hanging on the cursed tree, 
The double imputation takes place. First, the first imputation. Our sins are imputed to him. So that the one who knew no sin became sin for us. And there the person of Christ feels the full Trinitarian wrath of God. Wrath from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are poured out on the person of Christ. And there he faces full wrath that should have been ours. So that Christ is both, that God is both the justifier and the just. And then the second imputation takes place. His earned obedience grants him righteousness by God and he imputes at the moment of saving faith his perfect righteousness to us so that at the moment of saving faith we have two elements one we're forgiven of our sin and two we're fully righteous in Christ which means those two things we are fully justified at the moment of saving faith because we're in union with Christ because we are inseparably in union with Christ. Notice the second thing he says in union with Christ. He says this in verse 10. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That song, there's not, there's not a ton of songs that are theologically accurate, right? Most of them have some components of truth. But, but there's one that says, And the same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that is in you. That divine power that raised Christ from the dead is the same divine power in the Holy Spirit that is in you at the moment of your indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Which means this. Because Paul is saying that we are united to Christ, spiritually united, we follow the same path of suffering and humiliation that he does. We carry out the same type of service. He suffered as a servant. Serving who? Serving others. He suffered serving others. Guess what you and I are called to do? Serve others in the name of Christ. And as we serve others in the name of Christ, we're upholding the two great commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength and to demonstrate it by loving others as yourself. And only a mindset that is converted by the Holy Spirit, regenerated, can actually tell us and shape us and drive us to say, I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to be harmed. I'm willing to be hurt in my serving of other people for the name of Christ. As Christ went, so too must the people of God go in his humiliation. He served while suffering, so too must you and I. But here's the beautiful thing. The same power that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that is in you. What does that mean? It means, naturally speaking, in our fallen natures, we don't care enough about one another to serve each other. And we certainly don't care enough about one another to serve in in suffering for service of one another. It is only in that power of the Holy Spirit that transforms our hearts, transforms our minds, but also in those moments of suffering that allows us to put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, in front of the other, to continue to carry out our service in love of the name of Christ and loving those who we are serving and pouring our lives out in front of as as an offering. We follow our Christ in suffering. But we trust not in our own power, but the same power that raised him from the dead will keep us persevering day in and day out, day in and day out, and never in our own strength. And then he says one more thing. He says, even until the moment of death, most of us look at the crucifixion of Christ and we say, I'm grateful for Christ, but I don't want that for myself. Most of us, when we read the book of Acts and we see how Peter's going to die, we see how Paul is going to die, we say, well, that's just for the super apostles. Except Christ has empowered us not only to suffer, but also die if we must. That that our suffering is part of our testimony, and so too is our death. It is important how we breathe out our last breath. Is it in service to self or is it in service to others in the name of Christ? How will your section three of your testimony end? If God calls for us to suffer, which he already has and he will, if he calls for you and I to suffer to the point of death, one, we can do it not in our own power, by the power of the Holy Spirit residing within us, and two, it is an honor.
to suffer for Christ to the point of death. It is an honor. Do I look for that in my own flesh? No, in my own flesh I want to avoid it. But being saved changes everything. Changes everything. And then he says this. Verse 11. He says, in order that I might attain the resurrection from the dead. The way up, the way to exaltation in Christ is first through what? The steps to humiliation. But make no mistake, because the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, the same power that took Christ in his steps to humiliation up to exaltation. Remember that the road of exaltation starts with his resurrection from the dead. Three days his body was in the heart of the grave. Three days later, he raised from the dead, defeating death, conquering Satan. Conquering sin. And 40 days after that, he is raised in glory. He has ascended to the right hand of God in glory. All these psalms of ascent are aimed at that ascent 40 days after his resurrection so that he is the reigning king. And then after his ascension in glory, it says, he is seated, Psalm 110, as the second Adam at the right hand of God. This will blow you away so that the son of man, Jesus Christ, is also at his own right hand because he is at the right hand of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit's throne above all of creation as, as, and as the second Adam. He is seated now above all of creation, succeeding where Adam failed, carrying out perfect dominion until all of human redemption is carried out in the person of Christ. And there he sits in session, high, exalted, lifted up, exalted. And Paul knows that all the suffering we go through in this world, it is worth it. Why? Because the way up is the way down. To serve others in the name of Christ is the road to exaltation. We follow our Christ. He was exalted. He was ascended. He is seated right now at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning as second Adam over all creation. So at the moment of death, you know what happens? At the moment of death, those of us who are in Christ, our bodies immediately go into the ground and our souls are brought immediately up into the presence of our Christ and there we reside in soul with our Christ, the God-man, the second Adam. And we rule with him. His rule is ours. His dominion is ours because we are spiritually yoked together inseparably in Christ. And it's not only that, but he's looking forward to the next step in the road of exaltation. First, resurrection from the dead. Second, the ascension. Third, the session. And lastly, the return. The final judgment. You see, that's where the book of Revelation says, and the saints of old. The saints of God are right now with Christ at the right hand of God. And they're praising God and worshiping God, but they're also doing one other thing. Revelation 6 says this. They're saying, how long, O Lord, faithful and true, until you bring about the culmination of your plan, the pactum salutis. How long, O Lord, until you end all things and bring the final judgment because that's the moment we truly wait for is that final resurrection from the dead. The resurrection has two components to it. John 5 says all people everywhere are raised and are given a resurrected body. That means the sheep and the goats, the blessed and the wicked will receive resurrected bodies. For those outside of Christ, to those who are still under sin's delusion, they too will receive resurrected bodies to, co to, to co be combined in a conditional unity of body and soul, but they are forever fallen in their nature, which means even as they are sentenced to hell with a resurrected body, they continue to sin. How do we know this? Because Jesus says that in hell they gnash their teeth at God. In the Psalms, this is used twice, two locations. The book of Psalms, it shows your active hatred toward God. Their sin in hell continues. For those of us who are in Christ, 
For those of us who are in Christ, we too are raised, except we don't receive merely a resurrected body. We receive a glorified body and a glorified nature, which means we are given a nature which at that moment forward, we no longer can sin. We no longer desire to sin. In other words, we are raised to sin no more. And there we will be forever and ever without end, with our Christ, worshiping him, praising him, lacking nothing, missing nothing. And that moment is worth all of the suffering that we will go through here and now in the steps of humiliation. That is what Paul is saying. So friends, wherever you are right now in your life, whatever suffering you are enduring, whatever hardship you are going through right now, I promise you this, it is worth it because we are spiritually united to our Christ. He will never leave us. Let me hear, let me say that. He will never leave us, never desert us, never lead us on our own. He is always with us, joined together with him. And because he rose, we rise. Because he ascended, we ascend. Because he is seated at the right hand, you and I will be with him. And someday forevermore, no more tears, no more sorrow. Nothing from first Adam will ever touch us again because by saving faith, we're in second Adam. And there forever we will rule and reign with him. It is worth it. Friends, when was the last time you gave your testimony? When was the last time you told someone about the greatness of God in Christ in your life? Having four parts... Here's what I used to be. And we don't dare say that in a bragatory manner. We say it just as Paul says that he used to kill Christians. I'm sure he says it with a broken and wounded heart and spirit. We do not boast. We weep in what we were. And then we tell people about that moment of our amazing grace in Christ. Let me tell you the day that he pursued me and changed my everything. And let me tell you where I am today. I'm suffering for the name of Christ, and that's okay. He suffered, and I will suffer. It's proof of my adoption. But friends, no matter what you are going through today, God will not waste this moment of your testimony. Your suffering, your trial, is part of that testimony in your life that he will redeem for his glory. And you get to tell people where you're going. I'm with my Christ. And it's not just a hope, it's a certainty he will take me home. And that's an opportunity for you to say to that person, if you don't know Jesus Christ, let me tell you, let me share the gospel with you. Let me tell you all that can be yours if you believe by faith in Jesus Christ. May our testimonies as standing stones give glory and honor to the only one to whom it is due, Christ in him crucified. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you marveling at how with patience, with patience, you endured when we were rebels against your will. And Lord, we look back at the lives that we had, the passions and the idolatrous pursuits that we carried out. And Lord, we are ashamed. And Lord, then we marvel at that moment of matchless, amazing mercy and grace. That moment of our conversion when you saved us in Christ. May that be a moment that we brag about. May that be the moment of knowing you and joining you in relationship by faith. May that be the moment that gets us through the hard days and the difficult times. When you changed our heart and changed our minds, changed our passions so that we no longer see ourselves in lights, but you, you, you. And then may you give us the strength to be honest about where we are today, being sanctified, not yet glorified. We serve others in the name of Christ, but we do it in struggle, in turmoil, and times we fail and other times we don't, but we're in you. And may we long just as those saints of old long for the day of glory so that for the first time this old body can live to sin no more
to praise you without contrary feelings, to worship you truly in spirit and in truth. Lord, today may you use us as your standing stones, your living stones. May you place people in our lives today, this week, and we get to tell our testimony and highlight it with your grace, your mercy, and your gospel. May we make much of you. For you alone are worthy, and we ask.